Father, as we come together today, we are so thankful that we can pray for one another, pray for families and individuals, uh, pray for our staff, our building team, our elders, uh, the semi-annual meeting that's coming up. Uh, we've got a lot going on, Lord, but we see your hand in it. Uh, Lord, we see your moving us and guiding us by your spirit and by your word. And as we pray this, Father, this morning, we know there are other needs within our congregation today. Uh, some are just private things people are dealing with. Others dealing with things at work, family, a whole number of things, Lord. And as we pray today together, we're thankful that you call your people, that your, your house is to be a house of prayer first. And as we pray, Father, today, we just pray that you'd move in your churches across this land. Bless the pastors today, the leadership teams in those churches. We, we pray that you would move by your Holy Spirit. We realize, Lord, that we are in desperate times around us. We see all the circumstances. We hear the the wars and all those things, but you call us as your people to live for you in the power of the Spirit of God in those circumstances. So we live above what's happening. And so, Father, move amongst us, we pray, as we kind of introduce this next section of the book of Colossians. Um, give me strength today, Lord. I just pray for it. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. I forgot to mention, too, that uh, J Pastor Jay was ministering to uh, Beth's family. Her aunt had passed away, and so he had a, a graveside service uh, for that family yesterday. And, you know, as we've been praying as a staff and just ministering as a staff, um, and then elders and others of you who are ministering to people. Um, you know, yesterday as we spent time learning how we can just be a more effective spirit-filled witnesses for Christ, uh, we know that God is preparing us as we kind of move into a whole new segment of the life of this church that's been going since 1890. For some of you who... Uh, maybe have come along, you might think, oh, well, we're more like a church plant in a gym. But in the history of this church since 1890, uh, we've been in different places uh, because in the late 50s, early 60s, the church uh, uh, was being rebuilt again on the old property. And uh, there are just a number of things that uh, God has been doing uh, through the life of this church. This morning, I, I want to just talk about the, I, the theology of family in the Scripture. And in the moments I have, I can't really kind of give you the whole breadth of things. But over the next few weeks, we're going to talk about a number of things. The Apostle Paul, as he writes Colossians, and I'm just going to refer to Colossians a bit today. This is more of an introductory message. It has a lot of other scriptures. I'll be honest with everything that was going on in, uh, in our family. Um, I finished this message this early this morning. And um, so if you feel it's kind of rough or that I'm a little punchy today, or I'm offending someone, I just want to apologize in advance. Okay? And thank you, thank you. Yes, we are. And we, we're thankful because, you know, Gwen's mom leaves us a legacy of a faithful, godly woman uh, who loved Jesus Christ. And both her um, and my father-in-law, Wes, um, you know, uh, well, I'm married to one of their daughters, which is great, uh, and their two other daughters, and those three daughters uh, have just ministered in, in incredible ways to their parents over, the, over these, these days and times. And so what I want to talk about is really about 
Christ-centered, grace-filled family. And this, this is maybe a topic for some of you today that's really a, a hard thing because you didn't grow up in a Christ-centered or grace-filled family. Um, for some of you who have been blessed by the legacy of generations of followers of Jesus Christ like Gwen and I have, we're just thankful that, that, that what God has done has been, is being passed on not only to us, but also to our children and our children's children. That's what God meant it to be. But it takes Christ-centered people... And someone once said that strong churches produce strong families. No, it's the other way around. Strong families make strong churches. And when people know Jesus Christ uh, and in their family and they treat their family like a, a little church on the road or in the neighborhood and, and there's good leadership and, and there's, there's uh, working through problems and difficulties. We have to understand that no family is without its difficulties. And if you think you have a perfect family right now, you're in for trouble. Hello. Okay? See, the family is God's idea. And God created it. And the enemy, the devil, Satan, wants more than anything to divide families and hurt families and hurt people. In Genesis 1, 27, and I'll produce a set of notes and they'll be, they'll be up uh, this week for you. In, John, in Genesis 1, 27, God creates men and women in his own image on the sixth day together. Can you imagine that? He creates Adam and him. he brings Eve along uh, not too long after. And together they form the first marriage, but also the first family. In Genesis chapter 2, it tells the story again and maybe breaks down the day a little bit of the creation of Adam and Eve. And then at the end of that chapter, God establishes family in a very powerful way because it's repeated both by Jesus and the Apostle Paul in the New Testament. Because in that verse he says, this is why a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife and the two will become one flesh. And the idea clearly there is that they form a new family. They start their own family. But in Genesis 3, we know that the fall happened. Sin comes into relationships. And as a result of that breakdown, there's this breakdown in the family. And Adam and Eve had children. And, they, and their children have children. And we see in Genesis 4 that one of their children, Cain, commits the first murder in a family as, his brother, as this brother kills his brother Abel. So we see the power of sin. But even though sin entered families, God did not change his plan about families. God continued his plan to build his kingdom through families, through individuals, because his eternal family still to this day is built by individuals from families who put their faith in the living God. The nation of Israel was the next kind of segment of family where Abraham and Sarah, the first family of Israel, they have Isaac, and then Isaac has Jacob and Esau. And if you read the story, it's really not a perfect story. There's sin. There's issues going on. There's hard things that go, are going on. But God, as we see the pattern through the nation of Israel, he puts people into families. And then these families have households as well. That description is there. Why is that there? Because there are people that are added into families who are maybe outside the family, but become the part of the household of that family. So Gwen's cousin Linda, who she was with this morning as her mother died, Linda 
has served the Lord as a single woman all her life, but she's part of our household. She's like the second mother to my kids. She's had incredible influence through all of my kids and all the cousins, right down to all the great-grandchildren as well, right? Part of our household. And Gwen and I have had different people part of our household over the years. My church secretary in Winnipeg, when we first arrived in Winnipeg without children, and then children came along. She was an older woman, single woman, who served that church almost for 40 years, okay? She became part of our household. She babysat our children every Tuesday night for nine years so Gwen and I <coughs> could be in choir together, or do worship team together, or just go out together. And uh, she was a, a bigger woman, let's just say, and she had no problem putting any of our babies to sleep. They just found a warm place with her. <laughs> and she's gone on to be with the Lord. And it was a heartbreaking thing for us when we, after we moved uh, we moved to Vancouver. She came out and visited us a number of times there. Then we moved back to Ontario, and then it, we were heartbroken when she passed away. She was part of our household, and that's a picture of the church. That's the house of God. We're part of the household when we know Christ, whether we're single, whether we've gone through a divorce, whether we've gone through difficult things in our life, families going through difficult things. We're part of God's household the house of God. And then you see there are clans as well in Scripture. They had chiefs of the clans. That was really from the, the, that man and woman who uh, were following God. Then they had children. Those, uh, those uh, children had children. And they, they made up a clan as we see. And then out of that in Israel were the 12 tribes of Israel made up of all the clans all the households, and all the families, and all the individuals. And it's just an incredible picture that God paints. But then Israel gets unfaithful, right? We see the, a single parent family in Genesis 16, Hagar and Ishmael, and how God protects them, watches over them, because you know what God is? According to Psalm 68, verses 5 to 6, he is a father to the fatherless and the defender of widows is God in his holy dwelling because God sets the lonely in families. And in the evangelical church, I don't think at times we've been very good at including in our households those single parent families. We have men and women in our own church who are raising children on their own and they need our support, they need our blessing. They need, they need our prayers and, and they need us to love them, care for them, and help them to be about the household of God. James 1.27 says, Religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. So within the household of God, His church, Within our own households, we have the opportunity to, to minister to those who, who have lost a spouse, those children who have lost parents. I remember when I was a high schooler that uh, there was a, a, one of my, the deacons in our church and his wife, they already had four children. And, and we got word that uh, his brother and wife, who were missionaries, were killed in a car accident in Africa with their youngest child. And a few days later, the, the other four children showed up at their door. Right? That's what God's people do. Right? And, and, and so we see this uh, coming through God's purpose for the family is Malachi 2.15. Has not the one God made you? You belonged in him, in body and spirit. And what does the one God seek? Godly offspring. He's basically saying there, when we know Jesus Christ, that the purpose of God's family, God's church, is that we would see that the generations passed on with the gospel of Christ. 
godly offspring. In, that, in, that, in Malachi, he says he hates divorce because he knows divorce just breaks children up particularly. And he says here, so be on your guard and do not be unfaithful to the wife of your youth. He, he's really speaking to men there. See, God is a parent. When we know Christ, God is our father. We are his children. And God is the God of relationships. He wants, wants us to have strong relationships, not only with him, as we saw in the teaching yesterday, but strong relationships horizontally with all the people around us. And the primary goal, especially of Christian parents, is to connect with the hearts of our children so that they can connect with the heart of God. Saw this especially with Gwen's parents as they not only connected and loved us with the heart of God, but they passed on those types of things to us, right? Now, there are different kinds of families, even in Christian circles these days. Uh, I'm going to describe four very quickly today. First one is fear-based family, where there's a lot of intimidation. We're, we're so fearful about what's outside that we do not think God is big enough to deal with all the fear factor that's out there. So we usually bubble our children in plastic wrap, right? We don't let them outside. We don't, we're, we're so scared of the world and because we're so scared of the world, we start believing in, in, in the fear factors of life rather than the big God of life. And there's a big difference. Fear undermines our faith. Now, our faith, we are to fear God and be in awe of Him. And if we have the fear in the right place, then our faith is strong. Do we believe God can help us? Because God helps His people thrive no matter what the circumstances are happening in the world. Because isolation or trying to control everything or being a helicopter parent or even helicopter grandparents will not help your children understand the greatness of God. They will just see fear. You, 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 you with me? Then there's performance-based family where... For lack of a better term, someone has coined it this way, it's kind of evangelical behavior modification. It's a flawed view of the gospel. We're saved by grace, but in order for us to make it, we have to perform for God. We are into sin management. We want to keep people from sin and protect them from sin. And, and so we focus on outward behavior only, but not an inward change through a dynamic relationship with Jesus Christ. Because we start with grace, with the Christian life, we also are continuing to live in the grace and truth of God. But we can also go to the other side of what I would call permissive-based family, where basically anything goes uh, we outsource, even as Christian families, we outsource everything to others, coaches, Christian teachers, pastors, whatever, and we are not discipling our own children. They're basically parents abdicate the training and discipleship of their own children. And we just say, do whatever you want. The fourth level is really Christ-centered, grace-filled families. Difficult things can happen in a family because of sin, but we, when we minister the grace of Jesus Christ, the love and truth of God following his path, God has a bigger plan and even a bigger way to accomplish his will in families. And sometimes this takes years. You think of Jacob and Esau in Genesis 33. Jacob is so afraid of his brother Esau. Do you remember what happened? You know, basically Esau, you know, uh, Jacob and his mother plan this thing. And basically Esau trades his birthright as the firstborn to his brother. And there's a lot of strife in the family. It's crazy what went on there. And then all these years later, Jacob, you know, is living his life. 
all those kinds of things. And then he hears about his brother Esau coming and he puts all his servants' children out front first. Like it's just an incredible thing because he's afraid because Esau's coming with, I believe, over a hundred men who are with him. And do you know what happens in Genesis 33? Esau shows his brother Jacob what? Hatred, bitterness, anger over all of it. What happens there? Do you remember? What's he do? He's already forgiven his brother. Years ago likely. And he goes and he's hugging him. You talk about grace filled. Jacob's fearing for his own life. Jacob can't even get the words out. But his brother forgives him. Jacob has all these sons. And then he has a son named Joseph. And what do Joseph's brothers do to him? They try, you know, they try a lot of different things. They don't like him. They hate him. He's his dad, you know, Joseph's dad's favorite. Dad gives him the best fully colored robe, right? And what happens? They throw him in a pit to begin with. Then they sell him as a slave. Tell their dad a horrendous story that he believes. And Joseph goes through hell himself. He goes through prison. Right? He goes through all of that. And God raises him up to be the second in command in Egypt. Then there's this great famine. This is all years later. And guess who shows up in Egypt to get food? His brothers. And there's some neat things that happen. Joseph is doing some stuff. and They go back. They bring their dad back. They bring all of that, all those people back. And what does Joseph show them? Grace. What you guys meant for evil, God meant for good. You could just hear the emotion in his life to see his brothers again who are scared to death of him because he's all dressed in princely robes that God has put on him. And they're afraid, but he forgives. Then their dad dies. And guess what? The guys are fearful again. And Joseph ministers grace and forgiveness to them again. You might be wondering how things can change around in your family. But it might take years, it might take months, it might take weeks. It might take you just making a phone call and having a conversation or having coffee with someone to kind of break down the stuff that has hurt the past. See, some of us are wasting our lives with bitterness and anger about what someone said to us 30 years ago. And for some of us, those people have died. They're gone. And you're still carrying around bitterness and anger that's being poured into your family and into the relationships that you have because you won't give it up. You won't forgive. And you won't seek the forgiveness of God. In Colossians 3... We looked at the love and peace and the word of Christ, worship, and doing everything in the name of Jesus, which really points to healthy family dynamics. Paul's building on some things. But you know what? Some of you are, you know, in marriage right now. And what happens, you know, when you first get married, you're you're basically spinning two plates. Do you remember those plate spinners? You know, in the carnival or at the circus, you know. And they, you know, they start with one and, you know, there's, I, I wish I could do that this morning. I could, you know, spin it off this. or Then, then they, they add a couple more. So when you get married, you're, pl- you're basically spinning two plates, right? But each of you are spinning a number of things as well, right? And then all of a sudden, these little plates start spinning, 
they come into your life <laughs> and you're spinning with them and they've got needs to be fed, to be clothed, to go to this, to go to that. So, you know, then, you know, it, it's just amazing how many plates you're spinning at the same time. These belong to the school, so I don't want to break them. <laughs> All right. And then, then you're spinning more plates because you're just adding more things on because we live in a hurried society and some of us are so watching media that we need to add all these other plates because that's what's happening in our culture. And God never meant us to be in a hurried culture or a hurried family at all. And these little plates come along and then they, you try to, then this comes along. What this is? A teenager. <laughs> They're hard to spin. They're all over the place. Right? And they don't look like the other plates even. Right? Huh? Some of you are with me. Some of you have gone through it. Some of you are going through it now. Some of you are going to go through it. <laughs> right? But grace-filled families, grace-filled churches can deal with the problems. You know why? Because Christ and his word and the spirit of God will help us. And some of you have been going through difficult times, maybe in marriage or with kids or whatever. You know, Gwen and I have been through a lot of stuff. But I can tell you this, that Jesus Christ is here to help us. Amen. If we just trust in him, pray together as a family, talk through things together as a family, right? See, there's some misconceptions about grace. You know, John 1.14 says, the word became flesh, made his dwelling amongst us, talking about Jesus. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only son who came from the father, full of grace and truth. And you notice what comes first, grace, then truth. And there's some misconceptions about it. The unmerited favor and mercy of God is grace. Some of us fall into the trap that all oh, grace is only limited to salvation. It's grace through faith in Jesus Christ. That's the starting point for relationship with Christ. But we need God's grace, God's power to live the, the Christian life every day through the Spirit of God. We need His grace. We need His grace. But some of you who are a little bit more rigid might say, well, pastor, what about the boundaries? Especially with these people. <laughs> right? We need rules. We need discipline. We need consequences. So let me ask you a question. Does Jesus deal with you by grace? The law is still there in Scripture. Jesus came to fulfill it. The law is there to give us the boundaries for life and how we are to live. No, we're not to continue to lie. We're not to continue being sexual immorality. We're not, you know, there, there's just all those things there. The law is given for us, first of all, to convict us of sin, righteousness, and judgment. And because God works in us by His grace, Grace is his gift to us through Christ. We repent of sin and turn to him by faith because it's a gift God gives us who know the Lord Jesus. But we are to live it out with grace and truth. And their boundaries are there. The consequences is, are, are there. But in some homes, there's so much truth that becomes like a sledgehammer that the room gets very cold when there is no grace. Dr. Tim Kimmel and his wife have some great resources that focus on the theology of grace-filled marriages, parents, family, 
And yes, it applies to us as a church family as well. There are four freedoms I'm just going to share quickly this morning. And um, just bear with me. If I get through two, then we'll finish it off next week. We'll see what what time we've got. Um, As long as I'm done before one o'clock, we'll be fine. (laughs) Four freedoms for grace-based relationships. The first one is the freedom to be different. The diversity of people in the family and in the church is God's idea. Diversity does not mean you are doing things biblically or morally wrong. Romans 15, 5 to 7 says this, May the God who gives endurance and encouragement, boy, do we ever need that, give you the same attitude of mind toward each other that Christ Jesus had, so that with one mind and one voice you may glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. I love verse 7. It says, accept one another then as Christ accepted you in order to bring praise to God. And then Romans 12, 5 to 7, so in Christ, or so in Christ, we all form one body. Each member belongs to all the others. We have different gifts. So there's a diversity within the body of Christ. Look down the row. See the diversity of people in this place? It's amazing. Look, look down the row. Look at somebody else. I, I'm so thankful for the growing diversity of different people within our congregation, right? And, and and, and, and I, I remember this woman that came up to me when I first went to the church in Guelph. She comes up to me and she is ticked off at me. She says, I've watched your son for the last few weeks. This is ta- not talking about Justin, but Nathan, my oldest son. And she says, he comes to church in jeans every Sunday. I go, Jeans? And, and he doesn't come with a suit and tie on like my son. I said, no. And she says, you don't often wear a suit and tie preaching. I said, no, I change it up. <laughs> okay. And I, and I said to her, so what's the problem here? Because I have no problem with my son, who is 16 or 17 at the time, who still loves coming to church. And he's wearing jeans. And she says, well, he should be wearing a suit and tie. He's the pastor's son. And then she's, she, she, she does something that I go, I start laughing. She says, and Jesus doesn't like it. <laughs> and Jesus doesn't like it. I said, I said, your son wears dress pants every week. I said, how, how much do you pay for them? She says, well, what does that matter? I said, it matters to me. She says, well, I think about $40. I said, you know, my son's jeans cost him $110. <laughs> so if, if we want to compare clothing, he's wearing more expensive clothing to worship God than your son. And then I think she kind of got it a little bit. And I said to her, do you know what? I'd rather have my son coming to church in jeans and especially being under his, pa- his father's ministry and getting along with people and trying to work out his faith because he was at that time, then coming to church hardened by trying to dress up to please God. Because God looks at the heart. He does not look at the outward appearance. I mean, I've had parents come up to me and go, what do you think of my son's purple hair? I said, you know what? He looks really good today. I love it. Did you see him? I said, yeah. I told him. I said, I love your purple hair. Within two weeks, he, didn't, he was back to his regular hair. But sometimes what happens with us, I mean, she was making something a spiritual issue that was not a spiritual issue. Right? Don't make it a biblical or moral issue when it's not. What really matters is what really matters, and what doesn't matter does not matter. Wow. That preaches today. Psalm 139 says, We are all fearfully and wonderfully made. Some of you have boys. Boys are crazy. They do stuff. I've seen boys walk up to a brick wall and just go, against the wall. 
right? Boys are different. Then two or three days later, they do the same thing. They're just, we're just different. Nothing morally wrong about that. There's nowhere in the Bible that says you shouldn't hit your head against a wall. Okay? Now we're to be careful about things, right? Because certain things hurt us. But we are to have this freedom, this freedom, this incredible freedom to be different. Because we're different. And, and I mean, I've been in churches where you've got to have a certain spiritual gift in order to be spiritual. And I'm going, mm, that's not the Bible. Because we have different gifts. All right? Okay, second thing. How are we doing? You're still hanging with me? Okay, we'll do the second thing. The freedom to be vulnerable. We are not to wear masks or play games. We can deal with anything with Christ. I get a call at 7.30 today about Gwen's mom. I'm crying with her on the phone. I'm not afraid to tell you that. Cried with my daughter Mary. Right? This morning. Prayed for them. People need help. People need to share their pain. We don't go around embarrassing each other. I mean, the Apostle Paul is very vulnerable in 2 Corinthians 12.9. He talks about my, and, you know, that you know, he's working through this thorn in the flesh and this ailment, whatever it was. And God says, and my grace is sufficient for you for my power is made perfect in weakness. And then Paul's response is this, I love this. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest on me. So different from the world. We, we can rest in God's power, his 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 concern for us, all of those things, because his grace is sufficient for us. And that his power, when we're weak, is more evident. The world says, be powerful, stand strong, you can do it, you can do it, you can do it, you can do it, and then something happens and you can't do it anymore. You need God. Thirdly, the freedom to be candid. This is honesty without crushing Honesty is where we speak with the consideration of the other in mind. Ephesians 4.15, instead of speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is head of this is Christ. See, if you want respect from family, friends, neighbors, speak and act respectfully. Treat your family members like you want to be treated by the Lord. Quit looking at the specks in other people's lives rather than the log in your own eye. And if you're falling into the trap of criticizing your kids, criticizing your mother, criticizing your father, criticizing your spouse, the devil wants that because he doesn't want you to look at the stuff that you need to deal with first. And to be honest, you might be hindering the work of God in your family because you've been criticizing so many other people that you can't look at what God wants to do in your life. To set you free in order to bring a grace-filled, Christ-centered family back in your life. And if you're a Christian doing that, you've missed Colossians chapter 3. And then the fourth thing is give people the freedom to fail and make mistakes. Remember Jesus with Peter? Peter, Peter is in dread after he rejects Jesus three times. But he went to Jesus and Jesus went to him and Jesus forgives him and Jesus restores him. Because that's where we get restored is what Jesus, no matter what has happened in our past. Judas who betrayed him went to despair, and took his own life. And sometimes the Lord is just asking us to ask for forgiveness or seek forgiveness about something because he's there for us. And there are natural consequences to sin. But God, our Father, provides loving discipline in us. And even though there are consequences, he wants to renew us in the path that he wants to give us. As we see in Hebrews chapter 4, verses 14 to 16, and Hebrews 12, 14. You and I are to touch people with the grace and the truth of God. 
And over the next few weeks, we're going to conclu conclude Colossians, uh, this mini-series on the family. Uh, Paul doesn't say too much to men or uh, women and children. It's just kind of two or three lines. That's it. Why? Because he's already built out what a Christ-centered, spirit-filled family and church is to be like. And then he says, these are the things you've got to avoid. And that starts next week. Because in fact, we've been learning about healthy relationships already in Colossians 3. And now Paul deals with some specific family or relationship issues. As I was concluding this message this morning, I had to think about Wes and Evangeline Laird, Gwen's parents, I also had to think of Gwen's cousin's parents, Linda's parents, Uncle George and Aunt Joan. It's so interesting that Gwen's mom's roommate, while she's been in hospital, the woman's name is Joan, which is her sister's name. Now, this Joan is very different, but we are to minister to her too. But I'm very thankful through all the things those two couples have gone through, through the difficulties of Uncle George and Aunt Joan losing a, a beloved son at 19 years of age in a car accident on his way back from his final exams from McMaster. He was a brilliant young man wanting to be a doctor. And the things that we've gone through but what I've seen demonstrated by those two couples in ordinary ways is a Christ-centered, grace-filled family and each of them wanting to serve in a Christ-centered, grace-filled church. That's what it's all about for our families, for our church, and for our country. We need this demonstrated in powerful ways. Father, as we pray today, we thank you for blessing us, leading us. For some of us, we're spinning so many plates that, to be honest, they're not china plates. They're just plastic or paper plates, and they're not worth anything. Some of us need to drop some stuff. Some of us need to listen to the Holy Spirit through this song because we've been carrying around bitterness, anger, and Satan uses that so that we only look in the specks of other people's eyes or lives and we allow the sinful logs of so many things in our own life. And Lord, if we have that critical heart I pray in Jesus' name that you would set these people free by the Holy Spirit today. Lord, there are other families and situations, work situations, where we need Christ-centeredness and a grace-filled life. Father, we pray that you would help us to minister your grace, the saltiness of your word in ways that just show the love of Christ to others around us. And to have the conversations, Lord, to target, to look around, to listen, and to have conversations like Jesus. Take away anger. Take away um, the masks. Help us just to minister to people in uh, brokenness, who are broken, Help us to love on people. Lord, I thank you that you are the God who transforms us. Because therefore, if anyone is in Christ, they are a new creation. Old things are passed away. All things become new. And maybe there's someone here today, Father, that needs you. And I pray that your Holy Spirit would draw them to yourself. That they would repent of sin and turn to you by faith today. And Lord, begin the healing in their life we ask. We praise you. We thank you. Bless us as we respond with this incredible song today. In Jesus' name, amen.